Brethren, pray the Lord, the living God, our Father who is in heaven. And just like our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us that hallowed be your name, that your kingdom come. And so may God's name be praised, may God's name be worshipped here on earth while we still exist. So let us pray as we enter into this moment. Father God, we appreciate that this is your word ever, ever present. And we pray the Lord you bless us as we think through it again, together with the brethren that watch and listen, and that you'll bless all of us, each one of us, according to your full measure. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Pray the Lord, brethren, that we continue with our word in finding God. Finding God, our episodes coming every moment to enrich us, to encourage us, to energize us, and to revive our souls. Previously, we spoke about the book of Isaiah in its entirety. But then we discovered that the book of Isaiah is divided as per the chapters that we have, 66 into three books. First Isaiah, like I mentioned, is called Proto-Isaiah. Isaiah of the city, Isaiah of the royal court. Remember when he begins his message, he talks about kings. He mentions four of them. So he was in the city. And so he spoke from that point of view. And now those are chapters 1 to 39, which we looked through. And I hope that you have read and you'll continue reading those chapters which are having lament, judgment, but also rays of hope. When God speaks, like chapter 7, chapter 11, there is actually hope. Chapter 35, he speaks tenderly. Now, this second part is what we're going into. It's called Detro Isaiah. It's called Detro Isaiah. And these are chapters which range from chapter 40 to chapter 55. It's called Proto Isaiah. It's called Second Isaiah. And he is, in other words, also called the Isaiah in exile. Remember, chapter 1, verses 18, 19, but 19, where God was speaking to the people as a warning that if you are willing and obedient, you eat the good of the land. And, but if you disobey and are rebellious, you will be devoured by the sword. Now, like I mentioned some time back, that Isaiah remained relevant. He spoke the issues that were there then. And because people rebelled, it came true that they were taken into exile. So this time in chapters 40 to 55, he speaks, the message goes to our people that are in exile. So he's called Isaiah of the exile. And these chapters are, in other words, actually referred to variously chapters of hope. They are mighty chapters of consolation. Because actually, here it's also relevant. Friends, I pick from scripture that I, as a person or as a church, as an institution, we must and we are required to remain relevant to a situation that is prevailing at that time. Isaiah remained relevant during rebelliousness, when the people's ears were unresponsive, when people were deaf, they were, he lamented and brought the message that was relevant in the situation. Now here, the message comes to a people that are in exile, do they need condemnation? Do they need ridicule? Do they need rebuke? Now the message that God gives to the person speaking is a message of hope, is a message of consolation, because when they reached there, they discovered that, that they disobeyed God. The conditions themselves dictated to their hearts that we did wrong. We didn't hear. We didn't listen. And so while they were there, they, instead of God lamenting, they're the ones who are lamenting. 
And because they're the ones who are lamenting, God sends a message that actually believed to be a consolation, hope to them when they were in exile, Babylon, Assyria, and things like that. So he proclaimed that Yahweh was the only God and he was the only God, the God of the universe. Remember the, the oracles that were given, they were given to the people of Judah, they were given to the people of Jerusalem, but also given to the neighboring nations. And so the hope now being proclaimed here is not only hope for the people of the Jewish people, but also to everyone that cared to lament about their own situation, lament about their own sin, lament, feel sorry for what you have done. And I think to me this speaks greatly that Christian life rotates on this remembering, knowing that you don't exist on your own, knowing that what God requires is this, and then turn around, do good, turn around and be a blessing. And not just a blessing to other people, but a blessing even to yourself. And God requires that through us, other nations should be blessed. And so here, Isaiah proclaimed to Israel, God is people, God is servants, who were meant to carry salvation to all the nations. He had called them. He calls them my son. Israel is my son. Israel is my child. And so he meant for them to be ministers, to be missionaries to the nations. So instead of them being missionaries, they were doing otherwise. And the reason why he laments in chapter 1 and the ones that we read at some, time, at some point. So the Isaiah had a task of giving new hope. Can I repeat? New hope. An encouragement to the exilees, the people that were not at home, that had been carried away. But why were they carried away? They were carried away because of their rebelliousness. And the word of God came true, they were taken away. And many times, it may not be carrying away, but you are ruled in your own country. You are there, but hopeless. Hopeless. And so this message comes. And the reason why, it's they are called mighty chapters. I must be speaking to people who have preached, people that have read, people that have dived into the word of God. You realize that these chapters are the most read chapters because they, involve, they, they carry a message of hope in situations that are so devastating. And so it's an encouragement message to the exilees, to the people that had been disheartened, to the people that were in despair, to the people that had been forsaken, to the people that were hopeless. And so the message is spot on. Now, while I've been reading through, and something that I'm encouraging you to read, dive in. And these are chapters 40, like I've already said, 40 to 55. And chapter 40, listen, this is how it begins. A message that is going to a hopeless people, a disheartened people, agonizing people. And maybe about our, during our time, are we any better? Are we any happy? Are we any cheerful? Yes, we can be, but on the surface, but many distractions, the way they are prevailing, things are not good. Things dishearten us, and therefore we lose hope. Therefore we cry. Therefore we mourn. Therefore we, we, we groan. And so this is what it is. And so chapter 40, which is a, a prologue. And when I mention a prologue, it's the introduction, the beginning to this other, you know, chapters put together, 40 to 55. And so he says, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says our, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned for she has received from the Lord's hand, double for all her sins. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley 
shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord, verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Pray the Lord, brethren, that this message comes, comfort my people, comfort my people. Now, who doesn't need comfort? In your richness, in your wealth, you need comfort. Or in the time of agony, you need comforting words. In time of hardship, you need comforting words, words that can give you hope to the next level. So this episode that comes about the true Isaiah, the Isaiah of exile, the message is a message of hope, a message to encourage, a message to inspire, a message to inspire those that had been disillusioned, confused because of the situation at hand. And I discovered that the reason why they are most read is because our situations warrant that we need to read them. We need to speak about them to bring hope to ourselves. Because actually we agonize most of the time. We faint. And these people were faint-hearted. Why? Because they were in the land that were not theirs. And maybe because the treatment itself was not. And so God comes down whenever there's a situation that warrants his coming down to save his people. He is a faithful, he's a merciful father. The way he did it to the Israelites in Egypt. And you read Exodus chapter 3 there. And he says, I have seen, I have heard, and therefore I've come down to liberate my people. The reason why he called Moses in chapter 3 of Exodus, go and set my people free. And so God is our father. And I'm very, very sure that even during our time, when we sincerely come before him, when we sincerely cry to him, when we sincerely turn to him, of course, it can be an individual, but the call is corporate call. All of you come, comfort my people, comfort. And he says, my people, meaning that everyone in their, in, in their own right, to be comforted. And so friends, faint-heartedness. Now there are exilees, those who see no hope of returning to Jerusalem. There are moments you've been in good times, but there comes a time when you don't see any hope at all of, you know, of performing better anymore, again, of getting back to comfort zone, of Things can go bad. And so for these people, they're in their exile life. They saw that everything was not ending. And so they needed to be spoken to tender words. And you realize actually even during our time, we most times hear hard words, rock words that bring down all the hope. But we desire in our family, at home, at work, when things are not right, we need to realize deep down in our heart and then need tenderness. Speak a hope word. Speak a love word. Speak a care word. And this is what Isaiah is showing us in these chapters here. So these people were in danger of being won over to apostasy. Do you realize that actually when someone is in trouble, many, many people have backslid because of the trouble that they're in. Wrong teachings are taken by people when they are in trouble. People deviate. People fall in salvation because of the troubles that they are in. And people fail to pronounce their salvation because of the agonizing moments that they are in. And so this time, we need to speak a word to our generation. We need to speak a word of hope to anyone that cares to listen, like these people were over there in exile and they needed to hear God speak to them, that God works for the good of his children. Amen. And I say amen because God works for the good of his children. Even when we deviate, God follows. God will keep following. Where are you? 
God will keep calling, where are you? Because he desires the good for his children and he is sovereign even in the worst situations. The reason why the Bible says that actually God does not require the death of a sinner, but that rather a sinner repent and live. And he says that actually the soul that sins is the soul that will die. And of course, actually, Ezekiel chapter 18 speaks loudly there. And so my friends, God, he is a God who pardons. This Isaiah chapters 40 to 55 show that actually God is a God that pardons and he prepares his people for paradise. And I'm praying that actually God will pardon us. But of course, there's a condition attached. He cannot just pardon someone who is a wayward that you return. The reason why he says, if you repent and return, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. And so during this season, I'm praying to God that we are able to be willing and obedient to eat the good of the land. And now, in this chapter, we see that God pardons and he prepares us, prepares his people for paradise. And so this, this, this is the whole thing. Chapter 40, verses, you know, um, you, you'll discover that actually these are the following verses. 4 5 says, Everybody leveled. I saw that actually everything is straight, 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 straight. And I pray that actually God hears our prayers well, that actually every valley will be leveled. And He promises in these mighty chapters that actually the desert, desert places will be filled with water, flowing with water. You know, this is the message of hope that actually even patched lands. Patched means dry, lifeless. And there are moments when you are in a situation that is lifeless. Now here, listen to me, that actually God is a God of hope. So for today, dear my brothers and sisters, all of you listening and watching, where is our hope? Where is your hope? Where is Eridad Milton Ishisa's hope? Because I'm the one speaking. Where is your hope? Where is my hope? Now, true hope, friends, is from God. Of course, I can read Romans 15, 13, that may the God of hope, praise the Lord, the God of hope, fill you with all joy. It's my desire, it's God's ultimate desire, that he is a God of hope, that he will fill you with joy all the joy. So we see despair everywhere during our time. Diseases all the time and everywhere. Hunger, wars, fighting, tribulations, natural calamities, hopelessness, hopelessness, hopelessness. But our hope is assured not only when we look to the future, pray the Lord, but when we look back. Now, I have discovered that actually where you are standing today, you look at yesterday, you say maybe there's hope today. You know, looking back, maybe the situation was once yesterday, it gives you another opportunity to say, I'll live on another moment. And it does. And so this one is not only for, for the future, but also for today. And, and so the reason why we discover that when we, in this life, we look forward, future. And so First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, our hope on the grace that will be brought, brought to us, pray the Lord. And that is futuristic. And what is the future? I am totally believing that the future could be even the next hour. The future could be even the next day. The future could be even the next week. The future could be even the next month. And so the future, that which is not yet here now, but is on coming. So look forward. I ask you to look forward. Praise the Lord and look forward with hope that things are going to be better. Like Isaiah was telling these people that things are going to be better. But also, you are urged, you know, to consider what you're been through, holding fast on the hope without swerving 
because you already have it hold family in hebrews 10:23 hold family on the hope that you already profess praise the lord don't lose it don't lose it because actually time is coming when god will say yes my son my daughter so looking at the earlier promises you remember the earlier promises and when you close your eyes you see you know the reason why you we are told to close our eyes you know, it is a moment of, you know, you shut out a few other things and then you close your eyes and then you remember the promises of God. I mean, it's attention unto God. And so the promises that he has been faithful. He was with me yesterday. He was with me last year. He was with me last month. He was with me in sickness. He was with me in death. He was with me during agonizing times. He uplifted me he's still god and so the reason why when we consider what we've been through this is what isaiah chapters 40 to 55 indicates to us so and side by side we say yes christ's work and the present work by the holy spirit that the holy spirit is working among us praise the lord that he actually he promised the disciples who had become apostles in matthew 28 that behold I will be with you always. And so we pray God in heaven, our Father who is in heaven, that as he promised that he will always be with us all the time, we fix our hope onto him. And so, friends, these chapters, you've been reading them, and I pray that you read them again. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. Is that they, and these are the chapters which we read and say that even when you walk through the waters, even when you walk through the, you know, the, the fire. These are the chapters, isn't it? 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. Read on. And you discover that there is a lot of, you know, of encouraging message there. 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55. Praise the Lord. And then, you know, and to this, the chapters where you say that actually that no weapon formed against you shall prevail. Isn't this, isn't this, and at least the chapters, chapter 54, verse, uh, you know, 54, verse 17, you know, he says, you know, that actually no weapon, praise the Lord, no weapon formed, fashioned against you shall succeed and you shall refute every tongue that raises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Now, friends, I just want to ask us that get back. These chapters give hope, give light, might. Actually, at the end of the tunnel, there is hope. Just dive there. Like I've mentioned, from 41 to 55, they are mostly read because they bring, they give hope to the hopeless. And so hoping in God never leads us into despair because he has a plan for all of us who look to him. May I look to him? May you look to him? He has a future that is full of hope. The reason why we keep speaking about him, the reason why we keep mentioning, even when there are those who derail, there are those who discourage, but we encourage ourselves that keep there because hoping in God never leads us into despair. Now in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 18, the Bible says that there's a sure hope, sure future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. And I pray that actually this, that I may not be cut off, that you may not be cut off. Choose hope, therefore. Hold fast to the confession of hope without wavering. And Hebrews 10, 23 is the passage that I'm talking about here. Hold fast. Stick there. Speak hope. Now, if you have some hope to speak, speak it. If you have some love to speak, speak it. If you have some care to speak, speak it. Because life is so much agonizing. Life is so much 
devastating. Like these people were in exile and their life was devastating. What you need to get against is to be willing and obedient. Turning from evil, turning from lying, turning from evil deeds. And God has given us a way, repentance. And this is the point. Put right with him. Say, Father, I have sinned against you. I'm no longer fit to be called your son. And God will say, come on in, my son. Come on in, my daughter. And this is the hope that we're looking for. So friends, may God keep you. May God provide for you. May God enable you to read these chapters and be grounded. Choose hope and speak hope. Choose hope and stay in hope in the name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <music>